I think a lot of what drives our behavior is invisible. It's invisible to us and it's invisible to the people around us. And so I think a lot of times we don't stop to think or to have dialogue to understand what it is that's really in conflict. And we don't often think about all of that underlying framework. I think we would be paralyzed and we would not be able to function in the world if we had to explicitly and consciously think about all of the underlying assumptions and expectations that we have about the world. Welcome back to Yonder Lies. I'm Hannah Haberman. And I'm Jesse Bryant. If you spend enough time in Jackson, you'll start seeing the bumper stickers. They say, I saw Grizzly 399. I saw Grizzly 610. As these bumper stickers illustrate, some Jackson Hole Grizzlies, like 399 and her daughter 610, have become both locally renowned and world famous. Wildlife photographers travel to Jackson from all over the world to try and get a shot of these notorious ambassadors of the species we've so affectionately named Ursus Arctos Horribilis. <laughs> nice Latin there, hon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try my best. Anyway, celebrity mama bears like 399 and 610 have become famous to Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park visitors, largely because of their disposition, public persona, and gentle comfort around humans. Lineages of grizzly fame persist like royalty in this valley. For instance, the famous Bear 399 raised her daughter, Bear 610, in the sort of celebrity tradition. This lineage is sort of like the Kardashians of the bear world. Bear 610 grew up familiar with humans, perceiving traffic jams and telephoto lenses as as much a part of the background to her life as lodgepole pines and huckleberry bushes. And yet, while Bear 10 continues to soak up the attention, Two of her brothers have been killed by humans, one by a poacher and another for eating cattle. While one of Bear 610's sons, Bear 760, once described as, quote, a perfect gentleman, was euthanized by state officials in 2014 for eating deer that a hunter had hung from a tree. Bear 399 just made local celebrity bear headlines again when, on Monday, May 18th, the first day that Grand Teton National Park was reopened to visitors, she was spotted with not one, not two, not three, but four new bear cubs ambling by her side. An article about her grand reappearance and her many new cubs, published in local news source Buckrail, is titled, Her Majesty Makes the Scene, Kodak Kodiak is Den Mother for the Ages, and lovingly ends with Long Live the Queen. Honestly, it reads just like Us Weekly or People Magazine. But what didn't quite get the same amount of news attention was an event which happened just two days before, when a confrontation between a grizzly sow with a yearling cub and a man looking for shed antlers outside of Dubois ended with the bear being killed by Wyoming Game and Fish employees at the scene. The contrast between these two proximal events is stark. One bear is hailed as the queen, another ends up dead. Which brings us to the central question of this episode. How should humans coexist with grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Whose needs are more important and who decides? And what should we expect from bears and from ourselves? Solutions to what we often talk about as bear management are usually pitched as technical solutions. From bear-proof food boxes at campsites, to carrying bear spray while hiking, to compensation programs for cattle when they're killed by bears. We humans are never at a lack for cool technical ideas. And these gadgets are certainly important, but they're not the whole story. In this episode, we're going to take the conversation of environmental policy and problem solving around bears a bit deeper than some of our previous episodes, and certainly a little bit deeper than most of the dialogue happening in mainstream environmentalism today around bear management. We're still going to try to answer the admittedly very big question of how humans should coexist with grizzly bears. And we're going to try to do so through the lens of an incident that happened in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in the mid-1990s, the euthanization of Bear 209. And although this episode may feel more head in the clouds to some, we think that the framing of environmental problems that we're going to explore in it is necessary. And even more so as it becomes clear every year that our technical solutions to problems from 
bear management to climate change aren't really solving problems in the way that we'd hoped. Our technical solutions are often just treating symptoms rather than the actual cause. And for that matter, we're just treating the symptoms that we choose to see. In the simplest sense, what we're offering you in this episode is a provocative little idea that a professor of Jesse said in grad school one time. I'm paraphrasing, but she said something like this. When it comes down to it, environmental problems don't exist. They're only human problems. We need to move away from trying to dominate and manage all that stuff out there and instead really learn to manage ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And in a more basic sense, this wisdom obviously applies not only to environmental policy, but to politics more broadly and also to our personal lives. We're all oriented to see problems out there in other species, other political parties, other cultures, even in our romantic partners, in the other rather than in ourselves. But what worth is it to identify problems if the solutions lie outside of your locus of control? Right. What worth is it to be on a hike and say the reason you're having a bad time is the weather? Or to be growing a garden and say that the problem is the dandelions that have decided to take up residence? Or, for that matter, to be grazing cattle in Grand Teton National Park and be upset when a hungry and habitat-deprived grizzly bear decides that one of your cows would be a tasty dinner? In each of these cases, what we need to realize is the person in the center of the situation is perceiving a problem only because their expectations of what the situation might have been weren't fulfilled. The hiker expecting sun and getting rain comes to see the weather as a problem. The gardener expecting life to behave like an orderly library collection comes to see weeds as a problem. While the rancher expecting grazing cattle within grizzly bear habitat to function the same way as grazing cattle in Ohio may come to see the bears as a problem. The sort of philosophical question we're getting at here is how we come to perceive the workings of the world as a problem. Like really, what is a problem? Oftentimes in politics, and in life for that matter, we're always devising solutions without ever really asking what the problems we're solving actually are. If there was an overarching thesis for this episode, it would be something like this. The human experience of problems are always born from unmet expectations. The gap between how we wish the world would work and how it really does. When the world doesn't work the way we want it to or expect it to, we feel that there's a problem and we're taught that solving that problem means changing the world out there. But rarely do we address the obviously more manageable side of this, that is, managing ourselves, in interpersonal problems as individuals, or in environmental problems as a human species. And so if real problems always lie in unmet expectations of the world, then real solutions, right, should lie in managing those unmet expectations. In other words, we're solving for expectations. Specifically, in the case of natural resource management, problems often arise when peoples, or for that matter, other species, expectations of how resources should be shared aren't met. One step deeper, it's even more important to manage people's expectations about how the decisions about that sharing of resources are made to begin with. How to decide how to decide. Okay, let's let's stop there. We're going down (laughs) a bit of a rabbit hole. Yeah, getting a little too meta, a little too inception, but it's still important to think about. We'll get back to this stuff in a bit when we dive into what happened to 209. But first, let's just get some facts on the table about the history of grizzly bears. Support for Yonder Lies comes from Think WY, Wyoming Humanities. Wyoming Humanities supports programs, grants, and initiatives in Teton County and across Wyoming that explore history, culture, and the human experience. To learn more, about the Wyoming Humanities Council, visit thinkwy.org. Again, that's thinkwy.org. In North America, there are three types of bears, polar bear, black bear, and brown bear. These days, black bears are by far the most common. And while polar bears remain constrained to the far north, the once broad range of the brown, or grizzly bear, has been enormously reduced as a result of white settlement in the last two centuries. So in the lower 48, brown bears are called grizzly bears, yeah? Yeah, exactly. And the term grizzly actually comes from the Lewis and Clark expedition, who popularized the name in their accounts of what at the time was still the Northwest Territory. 
Anyway, records suggest that the range of the brown bear once covered all of the land between Mexico City, Ohio, and Alaska. <laughs> it's a pretty big range, and it's hard to imagine that now. Because today, grizzlies occupy only about 2% of that historical range. Now, they're mostly relegated to the spine of the Rockies from northern Montana, through Alberta and BC and north into the Yukon and Alaska. The one exception is the ecological island of the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, or the northwest corner of Wyoming where Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming meet, where we are now. And the presence of grizzly bears here isn't just because of the isolated nature of the area or random luck, but rather it's a result of intentional policy decisions that date all the way back to the 1800s. Yeah, bears first received an unprecedented legal protection in 1886 when the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park banned the killing of animals within park boundaries. Even 30 years later, in 1916, when Yellowstone implemented a predator control policy, bears were actually spared. Why? Well, because they'd become sort of a tourist attraction. The increased flow of people into Yellowstone National Park around the turn of the 20th century had caused the disposal of trash actually to become somewhat of an issue for managers who, at the same time, chose to just dump everything into open pits. Yikes. That doesn't seem like it would go very well. <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't. <laughs> Fairly quickly, all sorts of animals, including grizzlies, found the dumps full of tasty foreign foods and began congregating. As the bears congregated around the dumps, tourists congregated around them, and thus, for a period in the history of Yellowstone, the dump was the center of tourism. Yum. I can see the ads now. Come visit Yellowstone, home of the most beautiful trash dumps. And we've got bears, too. I can imagine it might not have been the best long-term business model for anyone. Yeah, didn't, didn't work out. The honeymoon period was actually pretty short. Grizzlies who'd been conditioned to human food began searching for it elsewhere, began breaking into concessions, and generally becoming just too friendly with tourists. Between 1907 and 1967, when the dumps were finally ordered to close, some 159 bears were either killed or shipped to zoos for becoming overly food conditioned. A quick definitional aside. You'll often hear two terms being thrown around in bear management lingo. There's habituation, and then there's food conditioned. They're two different things. While a habituated bear is simply an animal that's become desensitized to the presence of humans, a food-conditioned bear is one that's learned that if it performs a certain behavior associated with humans, it will get food. Many of the famous grizzly bears we talked about at the top, like 399 and 610, are very habituated to humans, but they're not food-conditioned. In other words, for 399, humans have become a harmless background to her life but they've never become associated with food rewards. If it isn't clear from those two definitions, habituated bears are very rarely harmful to humans, while food-conditioned bears might be pretty dangerous. Anyway, this is to say that in 1967, when the dumps were finally closed, the food-conditioned bears in Yellowstone who had not yet been killed or sent to zoos, but who knew that humans meant tasty food became very dangerous. Yeah, when the dumps were closed, the bears who'd relied on them for food became frustrated and began to move in hordes into areas developed by humans, looking for the trash they'd become so fond of. In 1970, a record number of grizzlies were killed for the crime of being overly reliant on human refuse. The first few years of the 1970s were the start of the problem that we're kind of still grappling with today. That is, what should the relationship between human development and bears look like? How close is too close? How far is too far? In 1973, Congress and the Nixon administration passed the Endangered Species Act. And in 1975, grizzly bears were added to the list of endangered species under threatened status, giving them a boosted protection status and giving managers a legal mandate to monitor and facilitate population growth. It's interesting to note that the greater Yellowstone grizzly is a uniquely designated species by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service meaning that grizzlies in the GYE could be listed as threatened on the endangered species list, while, say, bears in the Northern Cascades ecosystem could be listed as endangered. That is to say, they're essentially managed as a distinct, unique species. And ever since their listing as threatened, there has been a battle to get their protected status removed. That legal battle is perhaps a story for another time, but it can be summed up as this. 
the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and State Wildlife Services have pretty much always wanted the bear removed from the endangered species list, as well as ranchers and big game hunters more recently. Yeah, and almost everyone else basically wants them to remain protected. In 2017, U.S. Fish and Wildlife removed Endangered Species Act protection for GYE grizzly bears and also did not really commit to resetting a population management goal under this delisted status. A consortium of Native American tribes, environmental and conservation groups challenged the decision, asserting that U.S. Fish and Wildlife had exceeded its legal authority. In the fall of 2018, a district judge in Montana ruled in favor of the tribes and conservation groups, ordering U.S. Fish and Wildlife to restore endangered species protections to the Yellowstone ecosystem grizzlies. Almost a year later, U.S. Fish and Wildlife finally complied with the court order, announcing that the 737 Yellowstone grizzlies, as of 2019, were back on the list. Which is to say, grizzly bears like Bear 209 were, and now, still are on the endangered species list in the eyes of the U.S. government. So, what about Bear 209, the bear at the center of our story today? Yeah, before we jump in, I challenge you to set aside some expectations you might be having about how to listen to this story. Can you remind us of what some of those expectations might be? Yeah, let's try to work hard not to see the cattle-hungry bear 209 as the problem that needs changing. Or for that matter, not to see the unique fact that cattle are still grazed in Grand Teton National Park as the problem that needs changing. Again, the thesis we're trying to explore here is looking a little bit differently at problems. Imagining the problem to be the gap between people's expectations about how bear management should work in theory and how bear management actually works in practice. Okay, fair enough. But what exactly happened with Bear 209? Who was involved and why did it happen? Let's lay it all out. Okay, first the what. On August 4th, 1996, Wyoming Game and Fish captured the nine-year-old, 550-pound male grizzly, 209, with a leg snare in a cattle grazing allotment in Grand Teton National Park. Bear 209 had a long history of 16 cattle depredations, including killing 11 calves in just the previous three weeks alone. 209 also had a history of captures. Twice he'd been captured and translocated elsewhere in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem because of these cattle depredations. The history of depredation had him labeled as a nuisance bear. Now, when we think of bears like 209 as a nuisance or the problem, we then begin to devise solutions to fix it. Makes sense. The most common solution still used today is translocation, i.e. capture the bear, drive it 200 miles in some direction, and drop it off. But the history of translocations will reveal that the practice isn't a solution to anything. The bears just come back, but we still do it. Yeah, just a few weeks ago, on May 7th, 2020, Buck Rail reported that Bear 802 had been put down after two unsuccessful translocation attempts. The article noted that, quote, the bear was relocated to the Pilgrim Creek drainage in Grand Teton National Park. Within a month, it had returned to human populated areas. Why, after many years of unsuccessful relocations to the contrary, would we expect these translocations to work? The fact that we're still managing bears as if we were Sisyphus, pushing our proverbial rock up the hill only to watch it fall back down over and over and over again, means that this might not really be about the bears. Maybe it's about us. Since we don't want to take the time to reflect on ourselves, we just keep doing something, anything, even if it doesn't work. Sometimes it can seem like feeling like we're solving environmental problems is more important than actually solving the problems themselves, or for that matter, even identifying what the problem is to begin with. So in 1999, when Bear 209 was captured for the third time in Grand Teton National Park, he was taken to a Wyoming Game and Fish office in Lander and lethally injected. So whether it was Bear 802 a couple weeks ago or Bear 209 back in the 90s, Wyoming Game and Fish's arbitrary attachment to the number three when it comes to bear management remains. Three strikes and you're out. Seems simple, right? But in actuality, the killing of Bear 209 was just the beginning of the conflict. The same professor that I'd mentioned before, the one who doesn't believe in environmental problems, also liked to say, you don't know who the stakeholders are until something is at stake. In contemporary political science, people sometimes say, no issue, no public. 
And the incident of Bear 209 is a good example of exactly that. It forced people to get involved and articulate how they expected bear management to work. In other words, sometimes it takes an incident to really see what people's expectations are in the first place. Whether it be the killing of Bear 209 or a fight with your partner after a long day's work about who should do the dishes. I'm already doing the dishes, huh? <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but that's not quite what this is about. Thank you, though. <laughs> but in lieu of incidents like this one, people's expectations about how things should work would likely largely remain invisible or go unspoken. Basically, the killing of Bear 209 asked the community, do you think that this is a problem? I.e., did this process of how we decided to kill this bear meet your expectations? If everyone had said, yeah, it's totally cool, why I'm in Game and Fish, that you killed an endangered species in a national park, where the mission is to, quote, preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of future generations, then we wouldn't really have a problem at all in the first place. But as you might have guessed, that's not what happened here. Right. So who cared about what happened to Bear 209? Whose expectations were met and not met? And what were they? Independent researchers, government researchers, government officials, the ranching community, independent citizens, and of course, bears themselves were all involved in the 209 case. Despite divergent expectations about management, it's worth saying that basically everyone involved does expect that people and bears can coexist. Well, that's good. Otherwise, I'm not even sure why we'd be, t we'd be talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's important to also note that there are a lot of expectations about the world that everyone from park service superintendents to ranchers share. Almost everyone, with the exception of a few highly polarized perspectives, does agree on a pretty simple goal for grizzly bear recovery, increase the population of bears, which involves reducing mortality. But regardless, there was still enormous public backlash to the killing of Bear 209. Researchers felt that their data and their work hadn't been taken seriously in the decision-making process. Government agencies received public criticism. Environmental groups found the killing unnecessary, and ranchers were kind of split on the issue. Very broadly, ranchers have a lot of respect for the government agencies that make decisions that affect their ranches. But some ranchers were concerned that the backlash over the killing of Bear 209 would negatively impact public opinion about ranchers. A whole soup of perspectives. <laughs> In 2000, Dr. Christina Cromley wrote an incredible book chapter called The Killing of Grizzly Bear 209, Identifying Norms for Grizzly Bear Management. At the beginning of the chapter, Cromley wrote that, quote, although often discussed as nuisance bear management, which implies a problem with managing bears, the policy problem in dealing with conflicts between humans and bears is really a problem of managing people's expectations about how resources shared by humans and bears are allocated and how conflicts over these resources are resolved. Today, Christina is the vice president for the Board of the Policy Sciences. Up with her recently, she still remembered the issues at play in the Bear 209 case to a T, even 25 years after the incident occurred. Yeah, I think the goal in the case of Bear 209 is you have the Endangered Species Act and your highest level goal is the recovery of grizzly bears. I think the problem that you have is different stakeholders have different perspectives of what is acceptable behavior to achieve that goal and which activities should be allowed by the bears, which activities should be allowed by the people. And again, who gets to decide? Because I think with the natural resource issues out West, one of the toughest challenges is that there are so many valid interests. Even if you're talking about just those people that have formal power, the agencies, you look at the, the state agencies, the federal agencies, um, perhaps local jurisdictions, you know, and even within federal agencies, there's multiple federal agencies involved, right? So, and sometimes they have competing missions. So who ultimately gets to decide whether a bear should be killed because it's eating cattle? Yeah, that's really the question here. Who gets to decide the fate of the bears and how people expect those decisions to be made? To break it down a little bit, let's think about this decision-making process about incidents between bears and humans, like... A math equation. 
Ideally, the formula is made transparently and is clearly known to all involved. Everyone gets it. That way, people know what to expect as an output when an incident arises, whether they agree with it or not. But that's not really where we're at with bear management in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Yeah. In her chapter, Cromley points to three major variables or expectations that affect how people believed the management of Air 209 should have gone. The first is the plain and simple land designation where the bear was captured. The second is which zone in the management situation zoning system the bear was captured in. We'll get to exactly what that is in a minute. And third, broadly, people's expectations around continued cattle grazing in Grand Teton National Park. So first, land designation. Let's call that X in our equation. What designation of land was the bear captured on? Was it national park land, forest service, BLM, private land? And should that matter? In the case of Bear 209, some people said yes and some people said no. Whether officials like it or not, where a particular bear is captured does influence people's perception of whether a killing might be justified. And in the case of Bear 209, the bear was captured in Grand Teton National Park, a place where many people expect non-human life, especially endangered species, to take precedent. For instance, just after Bear 209's death, a petition signed by many Jackson citizens stated simply that, quote, we believe that a threatened species, such as a grizzly bear, should receive priority protection on its own habitat, particularly when that habitat lies within the boundaries of a national park. In contrast, folks at Wyoming Game and Fish believed that, regardless of land designation, quote, they were out of options for Bear 209, end quote. We offer these just to say that different people involved expect this variable to matter more or less. Take a second now and think about where you stand on this. What are your expectations in this situation? If the same bear was caught eating cattle in Grand Teton National Park versus a few miles east in Bridger Teton National Forest, would you think its fate as a critter with no sense for federal agency boundaries should be different? This sort of problem is why in the 80s and 90s, the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee, who is in charge of determining the fate of bears, developed and implemented what is called the Bear Management Situation Zoning System. It's quite a mouthful. Yep, <laughs> barely say it, which, which is sort of our second variable in shaping people's expectations about the treatment of bears. Let's call this Management Situation Zoning System our Y variable. This MS system was devised with the intent of creating a framework that would work across agency boundaries. In other words, Y tried to account for X, attempting to set up expectations about how bears should be managed in a way that cuts across land jurisdictions and agencies and their distinct missions. In this system, land in the GYE was broken up into five different categories, each giving different priorities either to bears or to humans. Land designated as MS1 is critical habitat for grizzly bear recovery. So if there's a conflict between bears and humans in MS1, the needs of bears would take precedent. And so to be clear, any of these habitat designations can exist anywhere, from national park land to forest service land to BLM land. And you'd expect that as you move from MS1 to MS5, you'd move from land where the needs of bears have priority to land where human needs have priority, a gradient. But this is where it gets a little more complicated. We've already said that in MS1 habitat, the needs of bears take priority over the needs of humans. But then MS2 habitat is defined as land where bear and human activity receive equal priority. So if each are given equal priority, how do we decide what happens when say, a bear depredates a calf? And if MS2 is where things are equal, then what the heck is MS3, four, or even five? <laughs> yeah, good question. MS3 areas are basically land where there's human development and thus bears aren't usually there, regardless of how good the habitat is. If bears are found there, they're removed. MS4 are areas that are suitable grizzly bear habitat but go largely unused by bears, so management isn't really a consideration. And last but not least, MS5 habitat is defined as land where there usually aren't grizzlies, but if they are, they'll be removed. Okay, so let me get this straight. MS1 areas are the only spaces where humans explicitly need to change to accommodate bears. In MS2 and MS4 habitat, it's basically ambiguous, whereas in MS3 and MS5, bears are removed if they're found. I'm, I don't know, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, but it's still 
seems like a tricky decision making tool with like a ton of gray area. Doesn't seem like it resolves much. Let's bring it back to Bear 209. Which which area was 209 found in? Right. 209 was found in one of the more ambiguous zones, MS2, where the needs of bears and humans are on some sort of equal footing. Okay, so our X variable is Grand Teton National Park. Our Y variable is MS2 habitat, the ambiguous one. And when this happened, it became clear that people expected very different things from the MS zoning system. For instance, Nearly all agency officials from Wyoming Game and Fish to Grand Teton National Park justified the killing by saying that it happened in MS2 habitat. Even though Grand Teton National Park noted that the killing was atypical, they said that in a summary report that the killing followed the interagency grizzly bear management guidelines. Despite these justifications, many other people expected differently. For instance, an attorney for the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund took the perspective that Look, the MS zoning designation had nothing to do with habitat quality, and thus it didn't meet the legal expectations of grizzly bear management under the Endangered Species Act. This is all to say, while some expected the MS zoning system to be the ultimate variable here to work as a decision-making tool, many others expected differently. And so that brings us to our last variable, Z. Thank goodness. Feels like my brain can't hold more than three variables. (laughs) Yeah, it's been a while since I've been in a math class, but let's keep going. So Z is how you feel about cattle grazing continuing in Grand Teton National Park. As we mentioned in our first episode, one of the original compromises between the National Park Service and the people of Jackson Hole in order to incorporate the valley into the National Park was that cattle grazing would be allowed to continue within park boundaries. And now, 70 years later, it continues to be a contentious issue. There are those who expect Grand Teton to look like all other national parks. That is, a wild place where human industries like cattle grazing don't happen. Right, and then there are those, like many ranchers in the area, who understandably expect that the original agreements and compromises be upheld by the Park Service. If you believe cattle shouldn't be grazed in the national park, then this variable is pretty big and most likely means you probably see it as unjust to capture and euthanize Bear 209 for eating cattle that, in your opinion, shouldn't be in the park to begin with. Alternatively, if you expect it to be normal for cattle grazing to continue in the park, this third variable probably doesn't carry that much weight to you at all. Yeah. So just to review, we've made this formula for people's expectations of bear management in the case of Bear 209. We've got our X variable, land designation of capture, our Y variable, MS zoning of capture, and our Z variable, how you feel about cattle grazing in Grand Teton. It is ultimately the job of land managers to weigh those variables in an appropriate way and make it clear to the public how and why those weights were chosen. But that wasn't what happened in the case of Bear 209, and ultimately that was a problem. In lieu of any clear decision formula or transparent decision process, the decisions on the fate of Bear 209 were ultimately just left to Wyoming Game and Fish. But what actually happened? How did Wyoming Game and Fish make their decision, Jess? Yeah, well, they're kind of in a pretty awkward situation of having to decide the fate of the bear themselves, rather than having a clear set of decision guidelines that were transparent and known to everyone. Again, in MS2 habitat, bear and human activity are supposed to receive equal priority. So then, how are you supposed to make that decision? Hmm. I do see how that could feel like a bit of a catch-22, like you've got your hands tied. They don't even know. And therein lies the actual problem here. Since all those involved don't know what to expect, they expect what they're taught to expect. Right. And although this might not seem like it's an answer to our original question of how should bears and humans coexist, it points to something broader, that we need to decide on something. Like, the problem in the Bear 209 case isn't really that the decision process wasn't doing what it was supposed to. The problem is that there were no clear decision processes to begin with. And that's not felt as a problem only by the public who, in lieu of any clear system, will always be disappointed. But also by Wyoming Game and Fish, who know that whatever decision they do make will not meet the expectations of a whole host of people, regardless of what that decision is. Well, there is a decision process. From my understanding, the management zoning system is supposed to create a clear decision process, but I guess that 
clear process gets muddled both inside the system and because of other variables like attitudes towards having cattle in the park. Yeah, but the, the first thing is that it doesn't seem like the decision makers ever really made clear to the public that this MS system was what we were going with, which is in itself a problem. But then there's the MS system itself. Uh, like MS2 habitat, where 209 was captured, is more of an indecision process than anything else. It just says, like, all needs are equal. And in doing that, it effectively just puts the decision into the hands of game and fish officials who thought that the point of the system was that they wouldn't have to make these decisions themselves. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that's a tough position to be in. But what we can take away is that this much is clear. In terms of environmental decision making, us humans still have a lot to learn. So, in a sense, we're saying that all these people have different expectations about how bear management should work, different expectations about which variables should matter here. Like, some people believe the National Park mission should supersede the MS zoning system, and some think the opposite. I feel like there's a super important question that goes one level deeper. Where do these expectations come from to begin with? Ah, yes. The million dollar question. And in some ways, this is what our podcast has been building up to the entire time. What's the name of this podcast again? (laughs) Yonder Lies, unpacking the myths of Jackson Hole. Myths! Support for Yonder Lies comes from Wildlife Expeditions of Teton Science Schools. For over 20 years, Wildlife Expeditions has been leading educational wildlife tours in Jackson Hole, Grand Teton, and Yellowstone National Parks. To see wildlife and support education, visit wildlifeexpeditions.org. Oh, myths. I'm a little apprehensive to go this deep, but let's do it. Yes. I've been waiting for this moment for so long to take our conversation about environmental problems down to its most human form. What we're about to get into may seem a bit out there, but I promise this is one of the most essential forms of understanding problems. And I think this depth of conversation is necessary if we're going to actually learn how to manage ourselves well moving forward. Right. And myths are especially important in the case of Bear 209. So first, when we say myth, we don't mean the typical definition of today, like a false belief or some Viking epic or myth buster. There's something along those lines. Here's Dr. Christina Cromley, who we heard from earlier about Bear 209, on the definition of myth. Common uses of the term myth is false belief, right? Oh, that's just a myth and and myth busters. Um, But really, myths are expectations about the world and what the social norms should be. And I I think they're, they're more fundamental than, they're not what the action should be, but they're kind of a, a deeper a deeper level of belief. And if you think about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, right, those are the doctrine of our country, that all men are created equal. What that means over time has evolved. I mean, at at one point, it truly meant all men. And it really meant all white men, right? And and through the civil rights uh, movement and the women's movement, the definition of man has expanded. um, and, And who who is created equally, (laughs) has expanded over time. But the fundamental belief is that there is equality, right? And who's included in that quality has changed. But the belief that that there should be equality um, has not changed. It's just expanded. The Miranda, the symbols of that are, you know, the, the flag or for the civil rights, for the expansion, you know, Susan B. Anthony and Martin Luther King. So you have these the this, this symbols that stir the emotions and kind of remind people really the meaning behind those fundamental beliefs that we might not necessarily think about on a day-to-day basis until they're challenged or the boundaries are trying to be expanded or redefined. So when we say myth, we don't mean a false story about the world, but the truest, unchallenged beliefs we each hold about the world. And breaking it down even further, myths are made up actually of three parts, doctrine, formula, and symbols. The example Christina gave of the Constitution is a really good one to illustrate the basic political myth of the United States. Right. So at the deepest level of myth, you have doctrine, 
or in this case, unchallenged beliefs in the U.S. Constitution, one of which is that, quote, all people are created equal. When it comes to the doctrine level of myth, we're talking philosophy. Not a true or false sort of thing, just a question of whether you believe it or not. Exactly. I mean, many people have tried to challenge the idea of equality with science or whatever, but every attempt has basically fallen short because what that doctrinal statement is really about is not whether I'm equal to, say, you, Hannah, but rather whether you and I should be treated the same by the government, which is a matter of belief, not of fact. But anyway, just above the philosophical doctrine of a myth, you have what's called the formula. Right. The formula is the basic practical social agreements that, in day-to-day life, realize the philosophical idea. In Christina's example of all people are created equal, the formula would be the Bill of Rights that lays out the practical ways of achieving that idea, like the First Amendment, which established free speech, free religion, and free press, or the Thirteenth Amendment, which bans slavery. Right. So within any myth, you have the doctrine, or the basic philosophical belief, which is realized by the formula, or the laws, policies, or social norms. And then on top of all of that, you have the symbols, or the images, the people, the quotes that point to a particular doctrine and formula. Yep. In the case of the American political myth of all people are created equal, and the Bill of Rights, the most obvious symbol is the flag. When that thing flies, in theory, it's to remind all of us of our doctrinal beliefs. Another symbol of this myth, as Christina mentioned, is Martin Luther King. A picture of King functions to remind us that, yes, all people are created equal. Yeah, and really, it's myths like these that guide our lives, whether we're aware of them or not. And so why are we bringing all this up? Well, because we believe that if people in Jackson can become more self-aware of the myths that are guiding our own lives, we may be able to see why particular conflicts continue to arise year after year, and hopefully be able to break that cycle. Exactly. There's that old Quaker quote, an enemy is just a person whose story you haven't heard. I love that quote. (laughs) I agree, it's a good one. But to review, a myth, as we're talking about here, is not a false belief, but rather a system of making meaning of the world around us. At its base, there's the doctrine or philosophical belief, then the formula or practical thou shalt of the myth, and then symbols or images, songs, stories, sayings, whatever, that reinforce the myth on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, and again, this matters because it's these myths that inform our expectations about how the world should work, and thus it's a divergence of myths that really underlie many environmental problems, including the case of Bear 209. Yeah, let's bring it back to Bear 209. What were the myths at play there? How did those myths establish different expectations of management, and how did those differences lead to something we call a problem? Well, Christina points to three particular concepts where myths and thus expectations diverged in the case of Bear 209. Myths about science, authority, and coexistence. Yes, I think especially with natural resources in the 90s, and again, it may have changed uh, a little bit, but um, there is a belief out there that if decision makers just listen to the science and the scientists and what the science said, that the right decisions would be made and any bad decision is because people didn't listen to the scientists right and what science is and the idea there is that that science is objective and that there is no human factor in research um and that science can produce an objective truth right and so that's one myth out there The myth Christina is describing here is the widely held belief called positivism, the doctrine of which is basically that science provides objective facts. In this myth, the formula then becomes, well, if we just listen to the scientists, then we'll know how to manage the world. And the symbols are things like wildlife crossings and the Sierra Club. In the case of our current COVID pandemic, Dr. Fauci himself has actually become a huge symbol of the myth of positivism. In some ways, today, this myth of positivism has been put on one end of the spectrum, while at the other end is what we might call the myth of relativism, or the belief that everyone's opinion matters equally, that the product of science experiments should be taken as just another opinion, that there are alternative facts. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. But back in 1996, when the Bear 209 incident happened, This myth of relativism hadn't really consumed our politics, and so what was really at play was simply how much people bought into positivism. And people differed. And this difference really shaped the conflict, particularly around how people expected the MS zoning system to be used, if at all. 
At the time, many positivist scientists involved felt as though the system was made arbitrarily and didn't take into account the result of their habitat research. In other words, they expected their science to guide the zoning designations, but they felt like it didn't, which undermined their expectations of how decision-making should work. This angle actually became the base of the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund's lawsuit, in which they contended that the MS zoning system was pretty much arbitrary because of how little it took into account research on grizzly bear habitat in designating different zones. Yeah, and to reiterate, like other myths, the myth of positivism is neither true nor false, but rather a belief that allows people to make sense of the world. In the 209 case, how much people bought into positivism seemed to also determine how much they expected the MS zoning system to be taken seriously. This divergence in myth, and thus expectations, was a part of the problem with the Bear 209 case. In addition to people's beliefs about the role of science, people's expectations also diverged along a well-trodden political debate in this country. Another myth is the respect for government officials to make decisions. Um, and the myth that if you, if you follow what the regulations are, the regulations will guide the decision, right? And you just follow the regulations um, and then the right decision is made. This is a really important tension, not only to the Bear 209 case, but also American politics in general. That is the basic belief about the role of the citizen in political life. On one hand, there is the basic democratic myth that decisions should be made by the will of the people. On the other hand, there is the competing myth that decisions are made best by experts and by those in power. Yeah, and in the case of Bear 209, the fact that the decision to kill 209 was ultimately left to just a few bureaucrats at Wyoming Game and Fish really shattered the expectations of many conservationists and citizens with a democratically leaning belief system. In contrast, there were also many involved, from the Chief of Wildlife at Wyoming Game and Fish to the Superintendent of Grand Teton National Park itself, Jack Nichols, that leaned into the belief that those in power had the authority to decide, and so whatever decision they made was therefore justified. Is shared perhaps more broadly that people and wildlife can exist, can coexist. Um, There is a counter to that myth and I think there was a t-shirt that somebody had on in one of the news articles that sums it up. Um, Screw the bears and wolves, save the cowboy. <laughs> right? So there is also a competing myth that, that it isn't either or and it's a competition and it's a war between nature versus people. Um, I think there, there's the myth that, yes, it's okay for people to coexist but nature should take precedence and then there's the opposite belief that people and wildlife can coexist uh, as long as people's demands are met Um, and so I think those are all all sort of competing but I would here the tension is between the myth of coexistence and the myth of human dominionism Hold up. Dominionism? We're getting into a lot of isms here. Can, can you lay out a definition for dominionism? Totally. It kind of feels like an SAT word or something. Human dominionism has its roots in Genesis 1.26, or the moment when God makes man in the Bible. It reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. To summarize, it's the belief that all this life here is here for human use. And with 209, there were certainly those that were pure human dominionists, but most people subscribe to more moderate beliefs in coexistence between humans and bears. While some believe that coexistence was possible, that the needs of humans are met, Others believe that coexistence was possible only after the needs of the bears were met. Yeah, interestingly, in this case, the MS zoning system tried to account for this by saying that different land should be treated differently in this manner, but it ultimately failed in that only really MS1 upheld the priorities of bears, while MS2 through 5 effectively prioritized the needs of humans. In essence, we've actually codified these two beliefs in land management. While national parks are where nature's priorities should win out, national forests are where people's priorities should win out. 
Right, except the problem with the Bear 209 case is that officials got it exactly backwards. Like, when we created Grand Teton National Park, what we basically codified was that myth that coexistence can be achieved through prioritizing the needs of nature. But then we went and killed Bear 209 in a national park. Yeah, and if you're someone who really buys into the myth that coexistence is possible only if nature, or in this case bears, are given priority, well, then you probably found the fact that Bear 209 was killed in a national park pretty repulsive. And also, you probably don't love the idea of cattle grazing in the national park. Okay, yeah. Let's try to pull this all back together. We're getting a little scattered. Okay, all right. So the thesis of this episode was that we all experience problems in the world largely because our expectations of how the world should work were not met. In the event of Wyoming Game and Fish deciding to kill Bear 209, we said that people seemed to expect different variables to figure into that decision. First, the land designation, in this case a national park, then the MS zoning designation, in this case MS2, and then third, expectations about cattle grazing in Grand Teton National Park. Right. And then we asked, well, if the problem is differing expectations about what mattered in the decision process to kill Bear 209, then where did these expectations come from? To which we said, myths. Yep. And in this case, we talked to Christina Cromley, who helped us identify three separate myths that were at play here. The role of science, that is positivism versus relativism. The role of authority, democracy versus hierarchy. And also, how coexistence should be sought to begin with, prioritizing humans or prioritizing nature. In Jackson, there are a lot of divergent myths at play on every issue. People move here from all over the world and bring with them their beliefs and expectations about what the relationship should be between humans and nature, or in this case, humans and bears. Right, and so here, maybe more than in other places, it's really important that there is a clear and transparent decision process. In the case of the killing of Bear 209, the decision was terribly ambiguous. Did it matter that 209 was captured in a national park? That was never really made clear to the public, let alone those with the power to decide. Yeah, and what about the fact that 209 was captured on MS2 habitat, which, again, meant that the needs of humans and bears were treated as equal? If everything is equal, who made the decision to kill 209? Ultimately, it was Wyoming Game and Fish. But again, they didn't want to be put in that ambiguous situation because they knew full well that any decision that they made was going to create a problem in a community with such diverse basic myths as Jackson. And that's a problem. In some ways, Jackson is a very homogenous community, but in others, it's wildly diverse. And one of those ways in which it's wildly diverse is on the question of how humans should coexist with nature. It's, it's funny. I, I mean, in the end, the problem in Bear 209 is basically just a leadership problem. I mean, what is leadership other than integrating all of those diverse myths and expectations into a decision process that is made clear and transparent to all? Look, I know that this episode has probably felt a little meta or woo-woo to some, (laughs) but that at least feels pretty concrete. The fact that ultimately, if you're someone with the power to decide on something like a bear euthanization, it will save you a lot of time and headache to make clear your decision process, whatever it is because at least then people know what to expect. Like, the last thing you want is what happened in Bear 209, where in lieu of a clear process, everyone just fragments into their invisible mythological camps, each coming at you with a different sense of the problem. Exactly. Like, as a land manager, the case of Bear 209 really makes clear that the only thing worse than the public disagreeing with the decision is the public having no idea how a decision that they really care about was made. I think that's true. I mean, there were solutions proposed along the way that would have hugely reduced the ambiguity. For instance, a chorus of folks offered the idea that all national park land should be designated as MS1 habitat, or where bears have priority, which would have actually made this case really simple and integrated the MS system with the mission of the Park Service. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a reason or a person for why that never really happened. Yeah. In a lot of ways, that would go against what I understand is the original intentions of the MS system, which was to cut across the missions and attach myths of different land agencies. So I'm not super sure where that puts us. Hmm. I'm reminded of where we started this whole thing, with the idea that environmental problems don't really exist, but there's only really the unmet expectations of us humans. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we humans are the biggest ecological force in Jackson Hole, and thus it seems obvious that 
learning to manage humans toward environmental goals will see a larger payoff than managing anything else. And to do so will require a new level of self-awareness, one that allows us to see the myths driving our beliefs and expectations about how the world should work for us. When I asked Christina about this, she agreed. The, what was happening biologically, ecologically in the system, it's because of people. If you look at their protections, it was because people, somebody decided that they should be protected. And then somebody decided they should be excluded from a predator control because they were a tourist attraction. And so if you look at the history of decisions about what we think of as bear management, there are decisions about people and, and our interactions and how we value the bears. If, if people left the Yellowstone region, bears would manage themselves. <laughs> Right, and so it's it's really that that bear human interaction, and we can't manage bears' expectations. So it's about managing people's expectations. It's important to remember, white settler society is new here in Jackson Hole. We're learning. It's going to take time to learn to live with all the non-humans here. But if we just keep focusing on managing problems out there in nature while never looking at ourselves in the mirror, coexistence will be just a lost dream. One that might even take the entire greater Yellowstone ecosystem down with it. Technical support comes from Jackson's community radio station, KHOL 89.1, and the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative. A big thanks to the Jackson Hole Historical Society for providing access to hours of archival audio. Special shout out to Doug Haberman for our theme music and Becca Hold Hewson for our beautiful cover art. If you haven't already, please rate and subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. And if you'd like to support the show with a small monthly donation, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash yonder lies. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash yonder lies.